Welcome to Launchpad, the unique radio show and podcast that celebrates new book releases and the authors that created them. Now, let's take off with your host, Grace Salmon. Welcome to Launchpad. This is episode four. I'm Grace Salmon, and I couldn't be more delighted today than to welcome to the Launchpad Judith Brenner, Janice Daly, Gail Ward Olmsted, and Debbie Weiss. We are taping live today, so please feel free to leave your comments in the chat, and we will try to get to all of them, if not now, after the broadcast. Let's jump right into these authors because they have amazing stories family stories, work stories that have led them to their new releases. I would like to start right away with um, Judy Brenner, who has just released her The Moments Between Dreams. It released in May. Judith, tell us about your book. Sure. So in The Moments Between Dreams, it's historical fiction set in the 1940s. It spans 15 years where Carol marries her first love. Um, she gets pregnant out of wedlock, but is in love with Joe. They have beautiful newlywed years, having a son and a daughter. But then the polio epidemic is um, coming through Chicago in the 40s. And no one knows what this virus is, but they know their children are getting paralyzed. And Carol is devastated when Ellie at age five gets polio and is paralyzed from the neck down. The same week, Joe gets drafted into World War II in the U.S. Navy. And there's tension in the air as, as Ellie is isolated and can't be seen by the parents except through a glass wall. But Joe has a temper and Carol blames herself thinking she's put stress on him because of her own um, concern for Ellie. And so she blames herself when he slaps her, um, but realizes it's not a red flag. It's just the stress of the situation because he has to leave. However, when he comes home from war, and Ellie comes home from the hospital. There's tension in the house that continues. And we watch Ellie grow through a teenager and um, become restricted by the father like Carol is. She's not allowed to drive. She's not allowed to wear makeup. And Carol's watching Ellie also get um, sequestered in this household that's becoming isolated. So the story has to go for forward to see how she can resolve this while still conforming to society. So your book, has a lot of themes in it of family drama. I love historical fiction. You also have a theme of protection there, as does Gail. So Gail, tell us quickly about your book. Miranda Writes is my uh, is my sixth book. It is contemporary and uh, features uh, Miranda Quinn, who is a disgraced former assistant district attorney uh, who is seeking a career comeback uh, with a, uh, a TV show, a live TV legal advice a talk show. And uh, when it comes to protection, um, out of the clear blue, right before she is uh, set to go live with this new uh, career of hers, um, a witness reappears. Um, and this is a witness from the case that basically tanked her whole career. Uh, the witness went missing, the case got thrown out, Miranda lost her job, her boyfriend and her home, uh, basically all in the same week. And she didn't realize back then that it was so connected, but now this witness comes back with a story to tell, one that implicates her, um, Miranda herself, as well as her ex, uh, Adam. So it um, Miranda has to protect this witness that came forward uh, while she's trying to get ready to air this TV show. So it's kind of at a uh, crossroads in terms of, you know, where does she put her time and attention and um, and try to focus. And your book is about an attorney, and we have a former attorney with us, <laughs> Debbie uh, Weiss. Tell us about your book and how that you got to it. Sure. Here's the book. It's called Available As Is, A Midlife Widow's Search for Love. Um, it's a memoir, unlike, unlike the other works. And I came to it when uh, my husband and partner of 32 years, he was my high school sweetheart, died of cancer. And I was trying to create a new life as a widow. I was 50 and I hadn't dated since I was 16 in 1980. And I was trying to put together this new life. My late husband was an engineer. You know, I, I'd retired practicing law at 40. I'm pretty much of an introverted bookworm. And I was trying to figure out how, how do you put together a life when you've always been so isolated? I lived in a pretty conservative community. So I just started going out and trying things and trying to meet people. And uh, most importantly, I, well, maybe unimportantly, I tried dating 
which was just shocking and, and somewhat toxic and really surprising to re be re-entering the dating world and trying online dating at 50 when I never really dated before. So I put about my misadventures and epic fails. There are some of those and eventually trying to find an authentic life and trying to get connection. And that's, that's pretty much what the, what the book is about. Um, so it's, I wouldn't call it a primer about widowhood, but it is what it is like to be widowed at middle age mm -hmm. or even alone at middle age. I, you know, I kind of feel like it's for people who find themselves unexpectedly unpartnered at middle age when they expected to be ensconced in these relationships for the rest of their lives. And then suddenly you have to move forward and you don't know how. I'm a very cautious person, so I had to take little steps forward. And that's kind of what I tried to talk about in the book, which was how to how to proceed and create a new life and look for love, be it with somebody else or yourself. Yeah, and you have a great handle too. Tell everybody what your handle is on your blog. Oh, so thank you. I am the hungover widow. <laughs> I started blogging in 2013 when my husband passed and, you know, I was ha had insomnia and was alone in my house for the first time. And I decided to be the hungover widow. I was I was drinking a lot of Manhattans then. <laughs> <laughs> Understandably, we've got a lot of viewers who are making great comments. They're eager to read your book. People are saying hello. If we can't see your name on the chat, please feel free to leave your name in your comments. And it's wonderful to see these comments. And I hope everybody will be looking at them. They understand all too well what being alone after being divorced in this mm -hmm. case is and what it's like to be single when that's not what you anticipated. Last but not least, tell us, Janice, about your historical novel, which is based on a surprising, surprising discovery. Thank you, Grace. So The Unlocked Path, historical fiction, my debut novel. Um, so author over 50, well over 50, just starting this world. Uh, but it was some genealogy research. You can see, remember to go which way, <laughs> the other way. Um, <laughs> on the wall behind me is a... Um, portrait of my great-great-grandfather, William mm -hmm. Shannon Pierce, who was a judge in Philadelphia, but through some of my research, I actually learned he was also a founder of the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. And mm -hmm. being a graduate of a women's college myself, I was immediately drawn to that story and wanted to learn more. So The Unlocked Path is a 23-year snippet of history of one woman's life, a fictional composite character imagined, Eliza Edwards, who attends the medical school in 1897 after her mother um, is very dismayed because she expected Eliza to just make her society de de debut, you know, become a wife and mother at the turn of the 20th century. But Eliza has other plans for herself. She wants more. She's going to do more with her life. And so she enters medical school supported by incredible classmates. Uh, some of them are actually based on real graduates of the Women's Medical College around the turn of the century. And then we follow Eliza um, through her residency, through some uh, love relationships, loved and lost and loved again, perhaps, and also pulling on the very rich history of that time, of the early 19th hundreds. Um, of course, we have the suffrage movement. We have a Spanish flu, a global pandemic <laughs> that first presented, <laughs> and World War I, and even, you know, the advancement and entrance of the telephone and automobile. So a very rich period and follows Eliza and her classmates becoming doctors when only about 5% of all of our doctors were women. So a, a brave and determined set. So, so two of you write historical fiction. What are some of the biggest challenges of that? Well, I, I would say um, um, just making sure you have beta readers who, if you slip and use a modern word, you want to make sure you, the dialogue is authentic to the times. And I would do a lot of reading of the same genre in the 40s and 50s so that it was in my head. To, and even listening to the music was a helpful ambiance um, as I was writing, but I really um, am grateful for my lovely writers group because once in a while um, when I was writing as Ellie or Tommy in the kids, I was thinking of my children speaking to me and I would say something you know, in the scene that would be not, not the right word. So it's good to catch that. 
Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that as well, and it's not what I thought it would be. But Michelle Cox, who's a fabulous mm -hmm. historical author, she's the first person who pointed out to me it's the dialogue. Janice, mm -hmm. what about for you? I was going to say um, the facts and making sure that you're not all of a sudden writing a textbook and nonfiction book. Because as a lover of history myself, I got so enamored with all of the information I was learning through my research and wanting to put in every little interesting fact and figure. But how do we select what's going to be meaningful to the reader, what's going to move the story forward and really make sense to include so that you are writing historical fiction, not a historical textbook? <laughs> And Gail, I want to switch for just a minute to some of the things that you've talked about. And all of us, I think, come to this, I think this is true, have come to our writing from other careers. Gail, you came to this through the marketing. I want to know, what did you bring from your marketing world to your book marketing world? It's uh, that that's that's a really good question. Um, with marketing, uh, the one reason I loved being uh, in marketing from the time I was an undergraduate till um, well into my uh, well into my thirties, I I loved marketing because it changed all the time. The tools, the tactics, the strategies, the the, the business itself, and uh, what what I could bring with me from that point uh, to now uh, for uh, for my own book marketing. Um, I'm, other than just an understanding, I think, of consumer behavior, everything else is different. I mean, with social media, it's because uh, I spent years in between teaching at the college level, primarily marketing and business communication. So I learned some of those um, tools and strategies that I'm using now, um, but learned them more theoretically than you know what I did uh, when I was in marketing. So, yeah, so writing is my third uh, third career. And uh, so far, my favorite. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it's been it's been enjoyable. Thank you, Debbie. I'd like to talk to you about memoir. This is something up until about two years ago. I never read memoir. And now I am so in love with memoir. Your story is so compelling. But do you think you'll continue to write memoir? What, talk to us about why memoir specifically for you. Well, memoir for me, probably I'm a little embarrassed. I'm a former lawyer again. I don't have a great imagination. I really couldn't think outside my own experience. I'm hoping maybe after this book, I'll be able to do that because I'm a little sick of delving into my own mind. I got an MFA to write this book because I wanted to be a better writer. So I got that in 2020. And um, our professor kept saying, go deeper, more interiority, more of what the character is thinking, but you're the character. So that's really hard. Um, but when I was widowed, I really wasn't finding a lot of material that I found helpful. Um, I didn't feel like people were really dealing with that pain. Um, so I wanted to talk about that in a way that made sense to me and how long it takes to recover and how that impacts mm -hmm. the character, which in this case was me. <laughs> it's hard being the character of your own book, I imagine. <laughs> It's really hard. It's embarrassing, especially when you want to be honest about it. You know, I've, get, I've gotten a few reviews and they're like, well, the, the narrator makes questionable choices. And it's like, OK, I'm cringing. Now. Oh. <laughs> That's a great segue to reviews. All of your books are now out and continue to look at the comments because uh, one of our viewers has said lawyers actually have great imaginations. And we're getting wonderful hellos from some of our regular viewers. Hello, Judy um, and Barbara Conry and Casey and Michelle Ann wait. So thanks all of that, you for being with us today. But let's go to reviews for a moment. Are we thick skinned, thin skinned? Do you look at them? You, have to, be, you have to be thick skinned. And yes, I do look at them. And I try to figure out if there's something, you know, the, the good ones are the ones that are constructive, you know, that they actually specify some things that they were concerned about or whatever. Um, one of the readers, an early reader of Miranda writes, uh, said she thought there was too much um, about uh, being body conscious and 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 uh, body shaming. Um, and the only reason I had that in there is because she was ready to go um, start a new career as a TV show host. And she was getting a lot of pressure about her weight and her appearance and, you know, taking care of herself. But I thought, you know, when I read the review, I thought, well, you know, that was a really, really good 
um, point and for you know for people that are have you know have eating disorders or issues or whatever uh, it could be it could be a trigger so if I can find something good or useful in the review I'm happy um, when I you know the the you know the the negative reviews that don't really say anything they just look oh, I don't really like the genre anyway those are the ones that are hard hard to handle. I think that with my own novel, The Eves, it was really hard. You know, we all love those five star reviews and the four star reviews, and I ent entirely agree with you, Gail. It's the constructive ones. The one that I hated the most was it was just one star and no comment. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you want to disregard it, but as authors, you really can't. Judith, talk about reviews and what you look for in yours. Um, I. I look, I actually am thick skinned and I don't care, but I have also been trying to make sure I don't false market the book. And so there's a careful balance of knowing who your audience is. And that's why I love NetGalley because it gives you that pre market launch information of who might be the right readers for your book. And the people who um, have suffered through polio may like it and some of them might feel it's too triggering. So it is truly a historical fiction base who likes to learn something. So I look for reader groups that wanna learn something because the polio epidemic is so um, fascinating to certain reviewers. And that's what, you know, you get surprised at an author, as an author, what readers are gravitating to that they liked in the story. Um, but I agree with both of you that, you know, the, the couple of, reviews that are one or two stars, I'm not hurt because it wasn't the right book for them. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and with NetGalley, or even with your writing in general, did you target a niche ahead of time? You mentioned that people are fascinated with polio. Did you put that in because it made a better story? Did I put the, the theme polio? In? The, no, the um, polio piece. Yes. Well, I, that was the onset of the book was I had dreamed ever since I was 20 to write about polio because my mother's a polio survivor. She mm -hmm. was. So that that was an easy one. And then it just was un unfortunate luck that COVID hit at the time that I was going to publish. And so the parallels of what the fear society has against a virus that you don't know it initially where it's coming from, how it's spread, and then there's mm -hmm. no vaccine initially. Um, and there's no cure. So right. those parallels just worked. Okay. Janice, I don't think we've heard from you um, on reviews. Well, debut novelist. So yes, I'm <laughs> checking reviews all the time and always buoyed, of course, to see five stars come in. Um, I had one that came in from a net galley reader as well. And she was a retired doctor from the Mayo Clinic. So to, to hear some, I mean, that was just so gratifying that I, I touched all the right buttons for her. I was accurate in my medical scenes and my beta readers in the medical field that had read for me because I don't have a background in medicine. Um, that, that was very satisfying. Sure. And so, and so connected to the theme of your book, which yeah. I would think that would be a fabulous one. Debbie, yeah. memoir. What do you know about that and reviews in general and yours specifically? Well... I don't have a ton of reviews. This is my first book. Um, I wasn't real involved in the writing community until I, I did write a book. Um, I can live with it. To me, the process was writing. I, I find it kind of disturbing these days anyway, because there's all these different social media channels and there's so much out there and it's so hard to get people's attention. And we all have publicists and we think, well, more should be happening with this. So, I've kind of tried to let the end result go and just go with the process because that's really all I can do and trying to sort of tackle all the aspects of media that supposedly lead to reviews and begging and pleading. I think my newsletter subscribers hate me right now is just it's just too much. I don't I don't find it a tenable way to market a book or work with a book. We were talking off air before about one of the things we're so excited about here on Launchpad is this gives us something other than the please review my book. <laughs> and it gives us a chance to all lift up each other, which for me has been such a critical part of being an author. I love one of our um, viewers just posted a comment that said, I got a one star review from a woman who didn't like magical realism because she said it was unbelievable. 
<laughs> Go figure. So, so I think one of you just said, though, that the idea is that it's not, I think it was you, Judith, that it just means it was the wrong book for that reader, mm -hmm. although that is a, a comical um, response. <laughs> Each of you, and Debbie, even though you are not a character, you are a strong woman. Why the importance on writing strong women's stories? I think that's that's become such a theme in almost everything I read these days. Who would They're like to much more interesting? I think people either aspire to be a strong woman, especially if they're if they're younger or not, their life hasn't been you know kind of planned out for them. Um, and I, I think they just make such interesting stories. And there's different ways to be strong, too. I mean, some of my characters are, most of my characters are quite flawed. I mean, they're not uh, perfect people. They're not superheroes by any means. But they find something within them that helps them to overcome what challenges they have and to um, have a second chance maybe at a, at a happy ever after or helping other people or whatever with friendships is always an, another big theme with me is all my main characters have amazing friends. And, and that's, that's what I've found has been the most helpful. And, you know, the research points to that women live much longer and happier lives if they have strong friendships. Debbie, you sound like you're very open and honest in your flawness and in your strength. Would you pick up on that theme for us? Strong women. I think it's really important. I mean, when I was a practicing lawyer in the 80s, there was so much sexism at my firm. And I remember being told to be more pleasant, which is not a word for a successful lawyer, nor a word that I believe the male attorneys were told to use. So I think it's really important, even though it's much later in time, to talk about some of that and what we of our generation faced. And it's something mm -hmm. I faced when I was dating with a lot of men who I found to be pretty entitled and kind of demeaning to women and even borderline misogynistic. And it wasn't things people were talking about. And I think we really need to talk about those inequalities, yeah. especially for those of us who weren't raised to be aware of them. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. I think uh, something all of four of us have in common, even though we're writing contemporary fiction, historical fiction and memoir, is the sexism that comes through in some of the the uh, chapters and I found that making Carol um, almost a week in her um, portrayal, that's where some of the reviews say, why didn't she leave her husband sooner? She's weak. Well, she was strong as her faith and her motherhood skills uh, to make sure her children were uh, safe first. So as Gail mentioned, the strength is shown in different ways depending on the, the scenes and the character development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd just like to add for historical fiction, uh, we have been very fortunate, I think, to have recently a lot more titles coming out uh, biograph biographical historical fiction, you know, bringing those women forward from the shadows who have never been written about before and showcasing them with the unlocked path. That was my intent. I didn't know that there was a women's medical college. And once I learned about mm -hmm. all the accomplishments, of many of those graduates. I was like, their stories need to be told. And yeah. Anita yeah. Diamant, who wrote The Red Tent, said, there's a hunger for those stories. Right. And so we're trying to satisfy that hunger. Oh, so so well said. So let's go back a little bit to the specifics of some of your books. Um, Judith, tell us a little bit more. What's your main theme? R please tell everybody again the title of your book. Sure. It's The Moments Between Dreams. And the title was chosen by my publisher, I first uh, named it Wheels to Liberty, um, thinking that wheels um, would re revolve around Carol, I knew at the end would be able to learn to drive. And that was her, her mm -hmm. sense of liberty. And wheels being Ellie at some points are use, is using a wheelchair. So, mm -hmm. but research showed that wheels to liberty, um, one, liberty was a patriotic term in the 2020 and wheels, men think of, oh, this is a fiction book about cars. <laughs> so <laughs> we went to Moments Between Dreams because it's a story of Carol's dreams and she's comparing her life to what it could have been had she not married in her mind the wrong guy. Um, so that's the essence of the theme. And we touch on um, domestic abuse and I wanna make sure that's a, um, a known trigger so that I don't want someone who's sensitive to that, that would be the wrong book for them if they don't feel like going down that path but I wanted to show why women stay. And I did a lot of research to understand um, 
why women do stay. And, and regardless that happens today, even though it was of course, even more difficult in the forties and fifties with the court system and with the society norm and even the Catholic church, which I play into the book. So it has those themes going through it. And I, and I'm very glad that they do. I think that they're important themes. That's a constant question. I think for women about why do you stay? And I don't think that that's a helpful question that everybody has their own reasons and abilities to stay or to leave. And I, yeah. And I want to point out that women stay because of knowing it will be worse if they leave, they might have to share custody with their abuser, not desirable, or they might lose custody or they are still fearful, as you can see from today's news, that they would be threatened or worse killed. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Janice, again, the name of your book and tell us more about it. So the Unlocked Path, um, Opening New Doors for Women to Enter Medicine. So of course, there's also a lot of women's health issues introduced. Um, my main character is treating women, caring for women. She's called to care for women, um, driven actually because one of her aunts makes a statement on, on her deathbed that male doctors don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so that sense of empathy and sympathy they're bringing forward and addressing with many women's health issues of the early 1900s and many that still continue today. Very good. Let's go to Debbie and then to Gail. A little more about the book. Um, well, it's a true story. It's what happened when I was widowed and, and went through the dating process and what it was like to be online. As a writer, I had to be over 50 and try Tinder just to give it a shot. Um, met a younger guy, saw what that was like, and basically also tried to deal with the difficulty in creating an authentic life um, for the first time being on my own at 50 after I'd gone from my dad's house to living with my husband, who has a very, very strong personality. So it was kind of like what it's like to create a new self after an all-encompassing marriage. And you also help others through your blog deal with grief. So this is a theme for you, uh, paying it forward, if you will? A little bit. My mom died when I was 10, and that gave me kind of a skewed view of, view of the world. And then when my husband died when I was 50, it was like, this can't be happening again. Mm. But I really don't like the fact that people don't deal with grief. You know, if you're looking at old medical models, if a kid was functioning properly, the thing was don't talk to them about the loss. And I think that warped a lot of us. So I do look at that. When my husband died, people are like, are you better yet? Are you over it? Like, like grief was more of a disease than a process, but it really takes years to get through this, especially if the loss was traumatic in some way, which it is for most of us. So I do feel like I wanted to talk about how grief is a part of life as opposed to something to be rushed through and shunted aside like it's like it's an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And like some of our viewers are saying, these are all very important topics. Gail, again, last but not least, let's talk about the title of your book and a little bit more about it before we wrap Just up. Just hold it up for once. Uh, it's Miranda Rights, which is a play, of course, on the term, um, legal term Miranda Rights or Miranda Warning. I just had this idea of this um, woman attorney um, modeled in part after uh, my late best friend, who was my favorite female attorney of all time, It um, and based on the Connecticut shoreline where we spent uh, summers um, as much as we could. I, I vacationed on the Connecticut shore with her family uh, every summer. So it uh, the theme really for me, again, is second chances. I always kind of go back to this. My last novel uh, was historical fiction, and I basically created a best friend for the main character because I think friendships give you the opportunity in literature to have a, a shoulder to cry on, to expose your true thoughts without going into a lot of uh, backstory. You can express a lot of what's going on with the main character through talking or through the eyes of a best friend. So uh, Miranda writes really is, um, there's a little bit of romance thrown in there, a lot of legal um, issues in the courtroom and outside of the courtroom. Uh, but at the heart of it, really, it's uh, Miranda is just, I just love her. She's just a, a great, to me, she's a great character. And um, the theme again, that uh, you know her, her friends are the ones who help her through uh, some difficult times and she helps them back. Mm -hmm. Thank you, each and every one of you. Thank you to our viewers. I 
and totally enjoyed. Gail, Janice, Judith, Debbie, uh, hold up your books and everyone find a new book, find a new genre. And thanks for being with us here on the Launchpad on behalf of author marketing coach, Mary Helen Sheriff, the Bookish Road Trip and myself. Thank you for joining us here at the Launchpad. Thank you. Thank you. This episode is copyrighted by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Thank you for visiting with us on Launchpad.